What we loved about some of the announcements coming out is actually the intricate detail you're giving of just who's on there selling via Shopify and how small some of them are. Was it a surprise of how small some of these online commerce players are? Well, we always knew that of the 2 million Shopify stores that many of them would be long tail businesses. The whole premise of Open Store is that we will offer to buy a long tail Shopify store or allow the owner to turn it into passive cash flow and take a break. Um, and we're always targeting one to $10 million GMV stores, so pretty small. But in studying the market over the last two years that we've been in business, we realized 85% of Shopify stores are very small and they don't have the tools and the opportunities to grow into that scale. So 85% of businesses on Shopify earn less than $50,000 a year. And so we're going to fix that. Anybody who's earning 50 to 500K, we'll allow them to apply and we'll give them access to all of our tools and expertise and try to grow them 10x mm. in a few months. Okay, and then they get into the remit of your sweet spot. So does your sweet spot change at all or do you continue to want to be looking at buying and running companies that are about a million to the likes of 10 million in terms of GMV? I think the biggest market opportunity for us where people don't have access, the brand owners don't have access to capital and where they really don't have a lot of liquidity options and they're confronting a, a really challenging uh, choice, which is to run a business 24-7, sweat 24-7 forever, or they can allow us to drive the business and we'll guarantee them the cash flow, or they can sell the business and walk away and do whatever's next and whatever's important in their life. This area has never had opportunities before. I think as you grow a business into $50, $100 million of sales, there's other options, but most people don't have those options, and that's why we exist. Of course, you exist to mainly help U.S.-based companies, right? But would you go global? Would you look at companies that perhaps are international in their, in their perspective, or at least where they build, to be selling via into the U.S.? Absolutely. We already will price to acquire or drive a business that targets U.S. customers wherever in the globe the business is located. For now, though, our focus is building a value proposition for U.S. consumers, and at some point in the future, we'll expand that. U.S. consumers have got quite a lot of choice right now, and in fact, they're getting a lot of choice from abroad. I'm just thinking of how Sheen is really managing to dominate, capture attention in the lower end price point of garments. You're thinking about TikTok that's potentially going to start adding shopping to its remit. Like, how is the world of e-commerce in the U.S. from your perspective? Well, most digitalization of commerce hasn't been very successful. So we're 30 years into e-commerce, and roughly e-commerce accounts for 12, 13, maybe 14 percent of e-commerce. And there's fundamental reasons why that's true, why there's a big blocker, is that nobody has a way of discovering uh, inspired purchases, products that you serendipitously discover when you're in the real world. If you're at a shopping mall or if you're at a department store back in the day, you see things that inspire you. And really the only way that works online today is through Instagram ads to Shopify stores, which is a very inefficient way of discovering products. Most of the time when you're on Instagram, you really want to see your friend's content. You don't really want to be shopping, but you get interrupted by ads and 1% of those people click on those ads and buy something. And that's you know not the best way to substitute to go to the design district in Miami or a shopping mall in New Jersey when I was growing up. But that's what we're building is aggregation that inspires purchases. And nobody in the West has ever done that before successfully. So how? Like when you've got, you know, DoorDash engineers, <laughs> some of the early ones really thinking about the way in which we engage and shop, like what are the innovations that we can't see around the corner of yet? Well, we're going to ship um, some products in the next quarter, so it's starting in September, that will show some inspired purchases. Um, the first thing we needed to do was acquire brands, products, SKUs, and a customer base. You really need, you know, you have a kind of a proverbial chicken and egg problem. So we needed to start with products and SKUs. Now that we have a supply of over 100,000 SKUs and over 2 million consumers that bought something from us, we can stitch them together into a compelling value of proposition that is a standalone app that people are going to want on the home screen of their phone. What's interesting about your business, of course, is that well, you're buying other businesses, sometimes outright, sometimes just managing. What's that like from a valuation perspective? Have those lifestyle CEOs, are they willing to sell their business when perhaps things don't look as pretty from a valuation perspective for them? Well, we've studied this empirically. 7% of brand owners on Shopify want to sell their business right now, and 74% want to sell it sometime in the future. So the acquisition process works really well for the 7% who want to sell. We'll make them an offer. It's very attractive. And then they can go on and invest the money however they like. Um, for people who are in the 74%, they may opportunistically want to sell 
but they can just get the cash flow and have the passive income with none of the stress. So we've kind of created a product suite that appeals to a very wide set of brand owners on Shopify. You've got 130 there or thereabouts of employees. What's the market like for talent at the moment, Keith? It's a great question. I think the talent's widely available right now. I think people are frustrated with large company bureaucracy and are willing to join new companies and you know, trying to transform parts of the world or all the world or industries. Uh, so that's become easier. I think there's a lot of less sort of vanity metrics and fake fundings is where companies are getting funded that they shouldn't. So people are you know, sort of migrating to create a critical density of talent around companies that have high potential. You can show off your high potential, of course, because of the the money that you were able to raise was it more than 150 million in equity you valued at about a billion dollars you're a man who also sits on the other side of the table and often is writing these checks in this environment how, how are valuations for big tech startups right now well we've been very disciplined at founders fund um, i think we've been consistently disciplined maybe even before the market changed but fundamentally there's been a massive transformation in series a series b and late stage growth uh, company valuations and so we're investing, but very selectively, uh, the right founders who are the you know, extraordinary founders with a compelling vision, but we have to pay prices and valuations that reflect reality. So we went through about a two or three year window when valuations were really divorced from reality. Mm -hmm. That occasionally happens in tech about every 20, 30 years, like this happened in 1996, 97, 98. But by 99 is 2000, you know, that three to four year window was totally gone and things were back to normal. So if you take an arc of 40 years, if you pay, if you invest at the right prices, things work out well in technology, but there's blips of two to three years when you can feel good with just momentum investing. Is there just momentum investing around AI at the moment? Right. I, I, we think so. I don't believe in AI companies as a good uh, you know, place for VCs to be spending their time, but I'm glad my competitors want to waste their money there. Really? Like... What what makes you reticent because you don't think that a lot of them are actually integrally AI at their core? Well, no, I think that there's a classic uh, structural advantage in new technologies. And some of these technologies are disruptive and they disrupt incumbents and their powers. And some actually enable incumbents to get stronger. AI is most likely going to generate more power for large tech large market cap tech companies not really be a substitute. And if there is a substitute, it's probably going to be open AI, which we've invested in, fortunately. Ah. And so how are you seeing the global nature of AI and the fierce competition there? Is, do you think that the US giants are going to be the ones stealing the thunder here? Or do you think it will be in China, for example? I'm, I'm seriously concerned about China's progress in AI. I think it's been underreported and under, uh, uh, you know, strat and uh, policymakers and regulators haven't paid enough attention. That's starting to change, but there's a lot of advantages China has in AI. There's less privacy, there's more people, more data usually makes AI, AI better. Their organizational top-down hierarchy may work better for AI building. There's all, so, and, the, and, the, and their computing power and their chips are actually pretty first rate. I think people underestimated that as well. So the combination is very scary. And this is a major threat to the United States. The future, the geopolitical future of the United States is whoever wins the AI race will have major advantages. So this is something that everybody in the United States, you know, from entrepreneur from the entrepreneur level to the presidential level, need to pay attention to every day.